Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by my friend, Lucas Von Gretsch. Lucas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bart. It's great to be here. Yeah, I I mean, we've been talking for a while, man, and I'm, I'm a big fan of what you've been doing with your own series, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But um, it's, it's very cool to have a member of the Gretsch family on the podcast, uh, which on that note, why don't you maybe start off by just explaining um, who you are and, uh, you know, your connection with the Gretsch family and all that stuff. Sure. And, uh, you know, I'd like to thank you for having me on the show. And I'd also like to say on behalf of my family, we would like to thank you for the wonderful job you are doing uh, with this podcast. And it's such important work. Um, Thank you, know, you. Maintaining and, and you know, you, you stick at it and you've done so many episodes and, and really uh, bringing out so many interesting features to the heritage of this instrument that we all, all love. And um, I would even, you know, I would even go as far as to say that listening to your podcast makes you a better drummer. Interesting. And under, understanding drum history makes you a better drummer because it, it gives your playing a perspective and a yeah. point of reference and um you know so thank you for doing that and sure. for thank you for making me a better drummer without having to practice <laughs> i appreciate it i i mean not even about my show but i agree where just looking at drum history it makes you just more obsessed with the instrument which makes you then want to practice which i think being a drummer is much more than just playing it's uh, it's looking at pictures, it's looking at logos, it's looking at old, it's listening to albums, it's all kinds of stuff. So uh, I appreciate that. That means a lot coming from, you know, uh, someone in the Gretsch family. Well, um, thank you, Bart. And um, just to explain, people might be wondering who I am. Uh, you know, I am what uh, you would call a modern day member of the Gretsch family. So um, it's my great, great grandfather, Friedrich Gretsch, who started the company all the way back in 1883. And it's my uncle, my mother's brother, Fred Gretsch, who's the current owner of the Gretsch company. Cool. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're in the direct lineage there. Um, so many Freds in the company, you know, <laughs> which that's right. Quite a few. And we're going to talk about all of them. Yes. Yes. Which, <laughs> so on that note, you have put together, um, a really nice outline that I have here in front of me to kind of keep track of everything. And, um, just before we start, I'm really happy to be doing a Gretsch episode because Gretsch is obviously such a classic, huge brand, but, um, I think I've only got one specific, um, Gretsch episode with uh, John Sheridan, who worked on the Gretsch book with Rob Cook and um, did a wonderful job. But I mean, that was like in the first 10 episodes. So this is we're mm. approaching 160 now. So it's been such a long time. Um, we're due for another Gretsch episode. So, um, Lucas, why don't you hop in here? And uh, we have this outline. We ha we're starting at Gretsch in the Victorian age, which is uh, quite a long time ago. So Take it away, my friend, and, and teach us about the way back history of Gretsch. Well, sure. And, you know, a lot of people know that that Gretsch is is an old company. I think most people know it's an older company and they and they think back to, well, you know, Max Roach and Tony Williams and then Elvin Jones and, and, and so forth. And they think it's an old company. But I think there's probably a lot of people that don't realize just how, how old the company is and you know, next year in 2023, we'll be celebrating our 140th anniversary as a family business. Wow. And if you, if you look at the year 1933, you know, which we'll be talking about later, it's, it's Gretsch was already an old company by 1933, celebrating <laughs> its 50th anniversary. So, wow. you know, so today I just, I want to take a closer look at, at the really old stuff and take a closer look at the key figures that laid the groundwork for Gretsch and what would uh, what Gretsch eventually would become in the 20th century. Yeah. So, so 1883, you said that is our founding date, correct? Yes. We're going to go all the way back. And I'd like to go back before 1883 to kind of look at what was happening before the company started. And um, we can start in the 1870s, um, where it's my great, great, grandfather, Friedrich Gretsch, who was living in Mannheim, Germany. And, um, you know, it's hard to, for us to know the reasons why he decided to leave Germany. Uh, we do know that he had 
a lot of family members living in the U.S. at the time, lots of cousins, aunts, and uncles. And they would write letters back explaining how well they were doing and how much opportunity there was. And so we kind of think that this has probably been the main motivating factor for Friedrich to, to take the journey and to come to the U.S. So, you know, like many uh, immigrants at the time, he had just such a huge network of family members already established at New York and throughout the country. So um, as a 16-year-old, he decides to board a steamship in 1873 in Hamburg, bound for New York. And um, the ship records tell us that he was alone on the steamship. And, you know, around this time, the transatlantic journey took about a week. And, you know, most people hearing this, they kind of imagine the Statue of Liberty and kind of scenario, but, you know, we're really in the early days of immigration. And so we're 12 years before the Statue of Liberty was even completed. So we're really in the early days of immigration where we're a solid 12 years before construction of the Statue of Liberty was completed. Yeah. And we're a good 19 years before Ellis Island. So he arrives at the first immigration center in the U.S., which was called Castle Garden, and we're pretty sure he stayed with his uncle Jacob Gretsch uh, and his American-born cousins. And uh, so he, ha he had a home environment to live in in the very beginning. And uh, in the registries of the time, we see that he was listed as a wholesale grocer. And we figure that this was probably at his half-brother's wine business, which was called William Gretsch Wines in, in New York. Hmm. And, you know, we, we imagine that he was probably learning the wholesale business and how to import products from Europe and sell them to the U.S. market at a higher price. Yeah, I mean, it's not drums, it's not music stuff, but I feel like business is business to some degree where you, you learn pricing and, like you said, wholesaling. So um, he I mean, things were things were lining up to be a businessman. Absolutely. And and um, he joins the music business when he joins a company called Albert Hoodlit & Sons, which was manufacturing banjos and drums. And he works there as a bookkeeper. Hmm. And uh, that, that was his big entry into the, the music industry. And so he's working at this musical instruments business and he meets my great, great grandmother, Rosa, who's a piano player, very musical, and also comes from a German family. So uh, you know, they're they're probably speaking German and, and there's a lot of German speaking and there's a lot of love in the air and, and they get married in 1879 and, um, you know, records indicate that they were living at Rose's apartment or her parents' home. They had the same address uh, yeah. when they have their first son, Fred Gretsch Sr. in 1880. Wow. And then they have their second son, Walter, in 1882. And these two boys, the second generation, would play prominent roles in the future of the company in due course. Sure. Yeah. That's so, it's so cool to just see this, though. I mean, so you said she was, Rosa was a piano player, correct? She was a piano player. That's right. And then the, the it was, Friedrich was her husband, right? The, the original coming over on the boat, correct? That's right. Yeah. That's now, was Friedrich. he, was he a musician? Uh, we, don't think so. Okay. So we, we don't think so. But he had the business brain exactly. going and clearly a, a go-getter coming over by himself on, right. on the boat and all that stuff. Cool. So he, he had what my uncle calls the E gene. He, did, he didn't have the M gene for musicality, <laughs> but he had the E gene for entrepreneurship, which ah. is a, a, a very strong gene in the Gretsch family for sure. Totally. So uh, then in 1883, it finally happens, and Friedrich Gretsch opens his own business called Fred Gretsch Drums at 134 First Street in Brooklyn, New York. And um, he would probably be upset that I keep calling him Friedrich because he had anglicized his name to Fred at this point. Okay. As you can see, the name of the company in, in the company registrations is Fred Gretsch uh, yeah. Drums. So just kind yeah. of downplaying the Germanness and joining the American club, if you will. Yeah. Well, and, and, uh, and I think it's neat to note too, that Gretsch started out with drums, you know, I mean, absolutely. Cause, cause guitar, I mean, there's, you know, you guys make amazing guitars, but like drums are the, the, at the core of Gretsch. Absolutely. Um, at the very core and yeah. uh, guitars would first appear around 1926. So much, much later, 
Okay. Um, so it's interesting, um, you know, when I th when I think about the um, the Gretsch business, I think I think about the bridges in New York a lot, and and how the bridges sort of symbolized interconnectivity, how the bridges sort of symbolized interconnectivity and commerce uh, for mm. Brooklyn and for the Gretsch company. And it's interesting to think that in 1883, when when Gretsch was opened, it was the same year that construction was finished on the Brooklyn Bridge. Hmm. And uh, so we like to imagine the celebration there because in, in May of that year, the Brooklyn Bridge, they, there's a huge celebration um, for the Brooklyn Bridge on opening day. And it's 1883 and there's fireworks and everyone in Brooklyn had the day off. And, and um, the president at the time was Chester A. Arthur, who some people may have heard of, <laughs> not one of the most famous presidents, yes. but that was the guy in charge at the time. But he's the president. <laughs> he was the president, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he gives a speech. And wow. you know, we, like, we like to imagine how, uh, I'll call him Fred now, how Fred and Rosa were definitely there and definitely walked across this bridge with their two sons, a one-year-old and a three-year-old, mm. uh, for the first time. And, and you know, at this time, the tallest building in Brooklyn was six stories high. So, you know, they're walking over this bridge and, it, and when they're at the center of the bridge, it must have seemed like they were on the top of a mountain yeah. looking, looking out. And, uh, you know, we, we just imagine them walking over the bridge on this day and, you know, boy, would they be surprised if they knew the heights that their company would achieve in the 20th century. Seriously. And, and um, they would certainly be surprised uh, if they knew that their great great grandson would be doing a podcast <laughs> in 2022 talking about them walking on the Brooklyn Bridge on opening I, day. Yeah, it's um, they'd be very proud of you. But I, I want to note on bridge uh, stuff that so here in Cincinnati, there is the Roebling Bridge, which goes from. Uh, downtown Cincinnati over into Newport, Kentucky, or it might be Covington, Kentucky. It goes over. But uh, I think John Roebling is the one who designed the Brooklyn Bridge. And actually, the, the Roebling Bridge here is a miniature version of the Brooklyn Bridge. Oh, so, um, cool. so, you know, that's my We're connection all to it. We're all We're connected. All connected. I'm, I'm basically <laughs> in the Gretsch family. Um, so. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> no, so that's really cool to know. And just to picture that, uh, that's got to be a proud moment, though. Um, just built being in America, building up this business, uh, kicking things off. The business started 1883, so they were making drums right out of the gate. Yeah, well, they were making uh, drums, uh, banjos, banjos, and tambourines. Yep. Okay. So anything with a drum drum head or a calfskin head, and uh, that was the focus. Uh, the focus items, hmm. and uh, you know, they had. It was a great, a flourishing business in the beginning. Absolutely, and and um from the start from the get-go and and not only was the business flourishing but the the family was flourishing they had a total of seven kids by 1895 and um wow. you know it's a small business you know it's, it's about 12 employees if we look at 1895 and we see they've so they got seven kids 12 employees and 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 if we take a look at this year 1895 it's a significant year because this is the year that friedrich Comfred sure goes on a business trip back to Germany. And interestingly enough, the night before he departs, he writes a will where he, you know, states that he's going to give everything to Rosa should he die. And uh, we always thought that was a little bit eerie that the night before of this trip, he writes his will, but he does. <laughs> and unfortunately, on this trip, he gets cholera on the steamship on the way to Hamburg and dies several days after his arrival. One one month shy of his 39th birthday. Oh my God, what a young guy. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, this theme of Gretsch, key Gretsch family members dying at a young age uh, begins here. You know, our family thinks a lot about Rosa at this time because she finds out her husband dies and she's left with seven children, the oldest of whom is 15 years old and a small burgeoning uh, business. And, you know, mind you, we're we're still in the Victorian age at this time, and most people, uh, you know, people probably tried to talk Rosa into selling the business. 
but she would have none of that. And she, you know, was very firm in her decision to keep the business. But to say that she only saved the business would really be an understatement because it was her persistence and her ambition, which would soon enough make Gretsch one of the largest musical instrument companies in the entire country. Hmm. Uh, so it's a super interesting period for Gretsch, for sure. And so yeah. she she completely, you know, she completely relocates the company from this small uh, shanty on Middleton Street and moves it to a larger three story complex on 104 South Fourth Street. Hmm. And there was a lot of talk at this time about there being another uh, bridge uh, connecting Brooklyn to Manhattan near Broadway. And so she heavily invests in real estate around this area ne near the East River, uh, near Broadway. This was uh, an investment that, of course, really, really paid off because several years later that, that bridge is built. Yeah. You know, it's, it's at this time, shortly after Fred Gretsch's death, that um, a super influential figure enters into the lives of the Gretsch family. And it's a gentleman by the name of Jacob Hyman. And uh, he is... Uh, he becomes a boarder at the Gretsch house where, where the Gretsch family lives. And, and, uh, you know, we often wonder, you know, why, you know, he was a su successful businessman. He was a jeweler and he was in his early fifties and he was retired, uh, and was a millionaire, you know, by today's standards. And Rosa was also a successful businesswoman in her own right. She didn't exactly need a boarder, but Jacob Hyman didn't have a family. So he was alone and he loved, the concept of family and he loved children and uh so he wanted to live with the gretsch family so that he could be around the kids and he was became very close to the, to the family and took them out fishing and was always very engaged in their lives and in exchange the gretsch family got uh connections from jacob hyman that proved to be critical for the growth of the gretsch company because Jacob was a successful businessman and, and had, uh, you know, was a part, was connected to the inner circle of the Brooklyn banking world. And he brought these connections to the Gretsch family, connections that would prove to be super important uh, later on. Um, you know, you think one significant person he introduced to uh, Rosa uh, and her sons was Nathan Jonas, who was the founder of the Brooklyn Jewish Hospital and was a prominent U.S. banker. And mm. um, so it's super interesting uh, to think about this sort of unwritten agreement between Jacob Hyman and the Gretsch family, and one that certainly had an everlasting impact on the future success of the Gretsch company. Yeah, He ends up staying with the Gretsch family for 20 years as a boarder. <laughs> and... and uh, <laughs> When he passes away, he leaves his entire fortune to the three daughters uh, in the Gretsch family and, and, um, and leaves half of his fortune to one of the daughters called Hertha. Hertha had been sick and, and really sort of struggling a lot with health issues and was a very shy child. And I think he felt sorry for her and wanted to support her. He knew that the Gretsch boys would take care of themselves. So he left his fortune with the girls and left half of it with Hertha and the other half split among the other two sisters. Mm. And, um, and the interesting thing about Hertha is she took this money and traveled around the world and had this incredible life. And you can learn about the women of the Gretsch family from my mother's homepage called lookingoppositely.com, uh, which talks exclusively about the women of the Gretsch family. No, very few mentions of the Fred Gretches. It <laughs> talks about their wives and daughters and cousins and sisters. And, and that's cool. a website my mother made. And um, when my mother passed away in 2020, she left behind a book. We didn't know she was writing it, but it's called The Book of Hertha, which is the sort of you know, half semi-imagined, semi-factual account of the life of Hertha Gretsch who received this inheritance from uh, Jacob Hyman. Wow. So, but that's a, bit cool. of, that's a bit of a detour from the drum history, but I wanted to give some family back, background information. Yeah, and I'll be sure to share that in the description. It's, it's really, I'm sorry to hear about your loss of your mom, obviously. It's, it's very cool that she was doing that. And because, you know, sometimes uh, like the about page on a website of like Gretsch.com or any, or like any of the drum companies sort of sums everything up, but there's so many more family members like uh, in, in this case, a lot of female family members that need attention. So it's really cool she did that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so 
we enter the 1900s with really a flourishing Gretsch business. And we see it's the key players at this time is Rosa and uh, her two sons, uh, Fred Gretsch Sr. and Walter Gretsch. And they incorporate Gretsch in 1903 and mm. uh, with Rosa's name listed first on the incorporation pictures kind of to prove to, as a statement of who's in charge. Sure. And, um, you know, again, 1903, we see this theme of, of bridges and, and it's in 1903 where, um, you know, we see that the Williamsburg Bridge is built uh, and representing further interconnectivity and commerce for both the Gretsch family and, and Brooklyn in general. So mm. things, things are really moving for Gretsch at this time. And um, in 1912, they expand their headquarters from a three-story complex to a larger, or they, they add on to an adjacent seven-story building um, at 104 South 4th Street. And uh, things are really growing fast, moving very quickly. Um, and if you look at the Gretsch catalog from 1912, it's 184 pages long. <laughs> <laughs> it's selling everything yeah you know, everything except harps and pianos basically you know banjos guitars yeah. mandolins uh, harmonicas brass instruments stringed instruments you name it and mm. um and it's really only manufacturing drums and guitars and sort of importing everything else so that's interesting i mean and and that's such a big factory i don't know if at this point gretch was claiming this but there's a lot of in these old um newspaper articles I've been looking through, there's a lot of times where they'll, where a lot of drum companies like Leedy or Ludwig or Gretsch, they'll, they'll all claim to be the largest drum manufacturer in the world or sure. yeah. which it seems like how many yeah. can there be? Cause everyone seemed to make that claim, but I know Gretsch yeah. really was, I mean, huge. And you see the, the kind of illustrations of the big, huge, um, the factory and all that stuff. Yeah, and, and and they can advertise anything, you know, if they feel like they're the biggest company, then they can say yeah. that in the advertising, you know, hopefully it won't be fact checked 100 years later. No, it's like the internet, though, <laughs> where like, you yeah. can say whatever you want. But but truly, they all claim to be the world's biggest. But right, right, that's, right. that's marketing. <laughs> right. So um, I guess, turn, you know, this is a drum history podcast, turning to drums, you know, we've, we're 1920s, we're, we're in the um, or, or the 19 teens were, were really still in the ragtime era and then sure. the very early days of jazz and and the drums at this point uh were branded as 20th century so they weren't calling them gretsch drums they were called 20th century and um you know it's before uh real drum sets are set up so we're selling the 28 inch bass drum and and the, the 12 mm -hmm. little 12 inch splash attached to that and the snare yeah. drums were flatter you've got you know three by 15 and five by 16 kind of dimensions for the snare drum and um you know um I'm sh i know you've talked a lot about drums from this era and and how interesting they are yeah but so it wasn't gretch it was 20th century was like the brand right it, on the, brand the drums was that called 20th century that's interesting yeah and it, it wasn't really until the 30s where my grandfather william gretch really said hey let's let's start making some gretch instruments you know and calling yeah. them gretch instruments that came a little bit later so interesting and so in this early 1900s i mean ludwig and ludwig was kind of in chicago making things happen but mm -hmm. they're so far apart i mean new york and chicago aren't that they're not the opposite sides of the country but they're not this wasn't something where people are shipping things back and forth. Was there a lot of competition at that point, you think? Or was it kind of everyone had their own region that they worked? Well, I mean, in New York, there, you know, there, the big wholesalers at the time um, was Bugle Eisen and Jacobson was a big wholesaler. Um, there was the Bruno was the name of another big musical instruments wholesaler. In, mm. in Chicago, there was the Tonk Brothers um so there, there was a lot of wholesale competition not much manufacturing competition i think at this point you know mm. um of course that would heat up much later yeah but that's so. an interesting thing to differentiate because of wholesaling versus manufacturing wholesaling would obviously mean that they and their 180 page whatever uh book would be selling things a lot of things made by other people that they were just kind of sourcing sure. and put out there but drums they were manufacturing Yes, drums and guitars at this drums point. and guitars and, and banjos. Yes, correct. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. All right. Well, yeah, keep going from there. Okay, so in, in 1916, uh, Gretsch begins construction of a massive 10 story manufacturing complex. And 
this is like a major, major urban renewal project that had a lot of support, a lot of support from the municipal government at the time. And, and this area near the East River on Broadway was kind of a dormant area. So they wanted to reignite this area, if you will. And um, so this building was huge, still is huge. It's still there. Yeah. Um, and it's it's got 20,000 square feet on each floor. And it's got windows on three sides of the building. It's just a really large building. Wow. And, and of course, when you when you drive from Manhattan to Brooklyn uh, on the Williamsburg Bridge, you can see it on the right hand side. It says Gretsch Building Number That's Four. Awesome. And is it um, condos now or something like that? Or yeah. So today it's it's uh, luxury condos, um, and I know Fifty Cent lived there. Maybe still lives there. You wow. Know, Multi million dollar price tags on these things, and yeah. Um, you know, and it's interesting to think this required a lot of financing, and they had connections from Jacob Hyman and connected to guys like Nathan Jonas and the bank bankers. And they were able to finance the, this, the family was able to finance this building, which at the time cost $375,000, um, which in today's money is about $10 million. Um, just to give you a perspective, yeah. obviously $10 million will probably buy you one or two apartments in that building today, <laughs> yeah. but that's New York real estate for I you, know. So. Things have changed. I, I also wonder, and uh, not to keep derailing, but I mean, that's right in the middle of World War One. There's a lot of more to that than than um, just, you know, a quick conversation. But I wonder if they felt anything, any World War One kind of uh, affecting their business at all with them having German heritage and all this stuff, if that was a factor at all um, hmm. in their day to day. I would say so. Um, you know, at this point in time, it's Fred Sr. and his brother Walter who are really running things and Rose's step back. And, you know, as the U.S. enters the war the year after they build 60 Broadway, uh, the U.S. enters the war in 1917. And there was definitely a okay. lot of um, anti-German sentiment going on at the time. Um, you know, you see a lot of companies at that time kind of downplaying their Germanness. And, yep. um, you know, you see... You know, one of the banks they work with was called the German Savings Bank in Brooklyn. And they they immediately, when this starts happening in World War One, they changed their name to the Lincoln Savings Bank just to sort yep. of downplay things a little bit. Classic, yeah. And, um, you know, it's really interesting because it's, it's this bank, the Lincoln Savings Bank, that we see uh, my great-grandfather, uh, Fred Gretsch Sr., who's also running Gretsch at this time, he becomes elected to the board of this bank. He was really heavily involved in the banking world. And, mm. um, but it wasn't all about banking for him. And he knew he had to keep Gretsch innovative. They had to come up with new stuff. And it's in this year, in 1918, that we see uh, him come, come up with the first multi-laminate uh, bass drum hoop, oh, cool. uh, which is using this multi-lamination process that they had, they had come up with. And, and what this does is it makes you know, hoops and shells lighter in weight and, and certainly more robust and stronger. Um, and up until this point, drums were just steam bent um, from a single uh, piece of wood. So this is a very innovative process. And we're really proud of this innovation because it's an innovation that's still really regarded as the industry standard today. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure. And I mean, 1918, we're approaching the 20s, which I think a lot of people um sort of put the 20s as like uh this is when the modern drum set really kind of came together because the you know the 19 teens was pretty disjointed to some degree i guess with like things are still getting figured out things are new you know the drum set being put together as a a unit but we're getting into that uh you know what we think of as a drum set obviously it's not double bass drum, huge power toms and stuff, but it's, <laughs> it's starting to look more like a modern, uh, drum set. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it just keeps evolving. And, you know, as we, as we move into the twenties, it's, um, you know, it's also the wholesale business is booming and the drums are developing and, you know, that Gretsch is selling over 3000 different instruments and accessories. And, uh, you have, and in, you have entire factories in Germany and Mark Neukirchen manufacturing solely for the house of Gretsch, which really gives you an idea of the volume that was going through uh, the Gretsch company at the time. Hmm. Um, so, 
and it's it's in the early 20s where you have this it's basically a partnership between the brothers fred senior and walter the second generation guys and um in 1924 Walter, the, the younger brother, decides to leave Gretsch with another Gretsch employee by the name of William Brenner. And they start their own company called Gretsch and Brenner uh, in 1924. And this company actually stayed in business uh, until the 1950s. Uh, so it stayed wow. in business for a long time and, and, and sort of competed with Gretsch, uh, but also worked with Gretsch. You know, they came out with their own line of drums called Rocket Shell Drums, uh, which was basically made at 60 broadway they were basically gretsch drums but they put the label on it hmm. um so they were working together in a way but there was definitely animosity between the two brothers and the family story says that when walter gretsch eventually passed away someone told fred gretsch you know your brother walter's died and he said i don't have a brother walter <laughs> oh my god so there there was some wow tension something really broke them up and and it's a very sad but obviously family businesses can be complicated yeah especially when you have two brothers and two ambitions and two egos it's it's a whole world of complex complexity yeah i mean it really is it fits into the classic drum story though to have people splitting off and there's a gretchen yeah. brenner there's there's like there's these they use the name but they add something onto it and then they're using the same manufacturing i mean it's very much uh in the classic drum company story to have something that's like right. that in happen. The, it's in the template. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. But that's really truly sad when you think about it, about family members like that, not working together and especially the history of how, I mean, cause it's really an old, I mean, it, it is a well-established business at that time. So it's a shame they couldn't, mm. um, work it out, but obviously things, things happen like that. Um, mm. okay. So yeah, keep, keep going from there. Yeah, so it's my great grandfather, um, Fred Gretsch Sr., who has at this point after Walter leaves, he has sole leadership of, of Gretsch uh, by the mid twenties, and and it's in this decade where he really begins to start grooming his two sons, uh, the third generation, or you know he had three sons actually, so he had Fred Gretsch Jr., which is his. There's another Fred Gretsch for you, <laughs> and this is the third generation's Fred Gretsch, and his name his name is Fred Gretsch Jr. He, that's what we call him. Okay. And then my grandfather, William Gretsch, and the third son is Richard Gretsch. And also in this third generation, there, there are three boys, like in the second generation, but you see this, when family businesses like this, there often isn't much enough room for the third boy. Yeah, uh, The sure. third youngest. So there's room for the first boy, some room left for the second boy. And then by the time the third boy comes around, you know, all the exciting work is is being done already uh by the older brothers so yeah you know richard um went on and had just a, a miraculous career with klegel lighting company and uh is a very interesting guy and he would actually end up outliving them all wow. um and um a great friend of the gretch family throughout many many decades well so, it sounds like he and like all of you guys like he had the e-gene as you said uh to be entrepreneurial um sure which man that's in your that's in your blood <laughs> to, yeah. to like take something and make a business out of it and it's also funny that if i ever get confused i can just kind of say was that fred gretch and i'm probably going to be right <laughs> there's so <laughs> yeah, many right. of them right that's cool okay right, well just to clarify you know the founders we call them friedrich gretch just to yep. simplify things and then the second generation owner we call fred gretch senior okay. and then the third generation owner we call fred gretch junior and then my uncle, who's the current owner, we, we call Fred W. Gretsch. Okay. Friedrich, Fred Sr., Fred Jr., Fred W. Right. Got it. That's it. Okay, so it's in the mid-20s where we see Fred Sr. from the second generation grooming his three sons, Fred Gretsch Jr., William Gretsch, my grandfather, and Richard Gretsch for future leadership at Gretsch. And they would spend their summers traveling to the Gretsch offices in Paris, and in the German town of Mark Neukirchen, which is where so many of Gretsch suppliers were based at the time. Um, Mark Neukirchen is just an incredible place. It's on the German Czech border. And today you still have over a hundred uh, instrument manufacturers there, you know, handcrafted wow. uh, manufacturers. And I would strongly encourage anyone who comes to Europe to, to visit uh, Mark Neukirchen and 
to check out the museum there. It's a musical instruments museum, uh, which sort of goes through the history of the hand craftsmanship since, you know, the 16, 1700s. Awesome. Can and, we pause uh, there though? So mm -hmm. what is happening with Europe um, with manufacturing and all that? Can you kind of give a brief explanation of like how it's working simultaneously? Like are things being made in Europe and being sent over here? Or is it like yeah. that's manufacturing for the European market? Or how is that really working? Right. So it's all evolves around Machneukirchen. That is the absolute center hub for European or uh, for musical instrument manufacturing. Uh, I would say even in the whole world, not just in Europe. Um, so, you know, the Gretsch family, when they were importing uh, from as wholesalers, it was all coming from Mark Neukirchen. They even opened an office in Mark Neukirchen to, to handle purchasing and duties and shipping and taxes and all that. So, yeah. you know, that that was Mark Neukirchen is really the place where the manu you know handcrafted quality instruments were being made, you know, at a low price. So they could be imported and and sold to the US market and sold for a profit. Hmm. Okay, so let's move forward from there. So we were in the 20s uh, there. Um, I feel like just the world in general, like everyone's having a good time. Jazz is exploding there. You know, people which which obviously with jazz being so popular, it means that more people see drum sets and drummers and they want to buy them. Who am I hmm. going to buy? Oh, here's here's a Gretsch drum set that or 20th century, I guess, at that point. Yeah. Um, so pretty cool. Pretty cool time. Yeah. And, and it's in the 1920s where Gretsch really begins because of the things you're saying. They begin to take drum production very seriously. And they uh, they recruit a drum builder from England, a gentleman by the name of Richard Dixon, who was working as a builder at the company Hawks and Sons in London. And this was a company that manufactured, um, they specialized in military drums with cast sterling shells. Hmm. And so in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, Richard would go on and play a prominent role in the, the manufacturing of the early broadcaster drums. Cool. And, um, and so what we see going on in the 20s is, is of course, the Symbol Wars, which we should talk about. Yeah. Um, you know, this is a um, this is sort of a heated trademark battle between the Gretsch families and the Zildjian family uh, over the Zildjian name. And you see, Gretsch had had begun importing Zildjian cymbals into the U.S. market in 1895 and played just a huge role in introducing Zildjian to the American market. So. In 1928, uh, Fred Gretsch Sr., the second generation Fred, he registers the trademark names A. Zildjian and K. Zildjian. He gets these names under his control. Hmm. Um, and a year later, Avadi Zildjian decides to move his company from Turkey to the U.S. in 1929. And, you know, he's obviously disappointed because he can't sell his own name, the, the products that have his own name on it. And uh, this begins a, a heated battle between the Gretsch family and the Zildjian family. But, you know, yeah. so Gretsch has ownership of the, the A Zildjian and K Zildjian brand names, two separate brand names. But because Gretsch is only making K Zildjians, they're not, they're not making or manufacturing or marketing A Zildjians. So they're not legally allowed to keep the name. They have to release it because they're not using the name actively. Which means Avidi Zildjian gets a hold of the A Zildjian name. Um, so the result is you've got the Gretsch family selling K Zildjian symbols and the Zildjian family selling A Zildjian symbols for many years. And you see in the advertising things like, you know, um, you know, they kind of throw a bit of mud at each other saying, you know, we're the real deal, you're the imitation. Uh, why yep. accept imitations when you can have the real thing? and um you know be aware of imitations and so forth yeah uh, and and because k were being made in turkey being imported by fred gretsch and then a zildjian were being made in quincy massachusetts by the zildjian family with the secret but being made in america so the whole thing would be these are real turkish symbols for k a would be we're the Zildjian family making it because then the K family right. sort of turned into the Dolgarians and Mikhail and those folks who then took the secret and then that turned into 
Zilco and later on all that stuff. So it, you did a very good job of kind of summarizing that in a nice because uh, if you read it, sometimes you're kind of like, wait a minute, who who did what? And there's there are court documents sure. um, that you can find, which I remember doing a Zildjian episode going way too deep and looking at that because uh, the legal battle went on for a long time uh, into the 50s, if I'm not yeah, mistaken. And so in 1955, Avadi Zildjian tries to get control of the K Zildjian brand, but he simply lost in court because Gretsch had legal ownership of the K Zildjian brand. Mm. So, you know, Gretsch could just continue selling K Zildjians. And, yeah. and, you know, you, you wonder, you know, how did this, how could, how did this end? Right. <laughs> this <laughs> yeah, horrific, like, horrific battle. Yeah. And, uh, and so what, what happened is it ended because in, in 1967, Gretsch is sold to Baldwin and Baldwin maintains the rights by through, by, because they bought Gretsch, they also bought the rights to the K Zildjian brand name. So Baldwin then continues to give the K Zildjian brand name back to the Zildjian family. Which is right. Things seem now like it's just Zildjian. It's just Gretsch. Like right. there's less disjointed split apart. That's K period Zildjian. That's A period Zildjian where it's like, mm. wait, what? <laughs> like yeah. it's just Zildjian. So that's good to know. Mm. Good, good on Baldwin for, you know, kind of ending the madness and <laughs> setting things straight yeah well there's there's you know there's the business side to the story you know businessmen behaving the way they do uh to make as much money as possible and then there's the moral side of the story and who who does who really deserves to have the brand so there's different angles to it for sure yeah so you know returning in the 20s we see um you know here, here comes the first scratch guitar 1926 and you know we could make another podcast about Gretsch guitars, <laughs> we'll just keep it on drums here. Yeah, um, you know, despite this, uh, starting with guitars, we see the 1927 Gretsch catalog, which is my all-time favorite Gretsch catalog. This really has a heavy emphasis on drums. Good. So, um, and it's here in the 20s, um, in 1928, that my great grandmother Charlotte, Fred Gretsch Senior's uh, wife, she passes away at the age of 47. And, wow. um, and, uh, she's the mother of the two future Gretsch presidents, William and Fred Gretsch Jr. And mm. yeah. And so moving forward in time, you know, 1929, we've got the stock market crash, which triggered the great depression and really set the tone for Gretsch in the thirties. So, you know, as we move along into the thirties, we've got the rise of swing music with, you know, Louis Armstrong and, and Benny Goodman and Duke Ellington. And, um, yeah. we're really talking, you know, big bands here and, you know, as you know, big bands play lots of different instruments. You know, you've got the reed sure. section, uh, you've got saxes and clarinets and, and a brass brass section with all sorts of horns and rhythm section with drums and bass and pianos. And, and Gretsch is making all of these instruments or, or selling all of these instruments. So it's kind of a fortunate turn of events for Gretsch that they yeah. suddenly, the music business is suddenly really pumping with all of these instruments, which they're selling in, in a large volume. And New um, York. I mean, New York is New a hub York. for all this. So absolutely, and and just like recording quality is getting better, I feel like people are becoming more um, modern day. What we consider like celebrities, where you kind of like you might see these musicians and idolize them, and you want to get their instruments that they have. It's mm. it's a big change from early 1900s to 1930s. I mean, it's like a different oh, world. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and so it's around this time that. Um, you know, th this era is really, it's its Fred Gretsch Sr., the second generation. He's really starting to groom his sons in the 1930s. And because they're, they're adults now, his two boys, m primarily the first and second son, uh, Fred Gretsch Jr. and my grandfather, William Gretsch. So, and um, my grandfather gets sent to Chicago to, to run the Midwest office to handle everything west of Ohio. And, um, and, and we hit the year 1933, which is our big 50th year celebration. Uh, and, you know, 1933, the Radio City Music Hall opens with the Radio City Music Hall Orchestra and none other than the great Billy Gladstone as its uh, principal percussionist. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Billy was just a world-class snare drummer and, and also a world-class inventor. You know, he yep. invented things like, you know, bass drum spurs and xylophone dampening switches and things we're using today for sure and yeah and um you know and the patent that that would really pay off for billy was was his three-way 
tensioning system, uh, which would be used on the famous Gretsch Gladstone snare. Yeah, which there Chet Falzerano has a full episode about Billy Gladstone, which is worth um I mean, he he obviously deserves and and he got a whole episode because Billy Gladstone is just one of those people where I, I think in that episode, I kind of said like like George Way or these guys who were just like behind the scenes, like inventors who like mm. really changed the game with their uh, the way their brain worked. A drum is a relatively simple instrument, but little things can be improved upon to make it better and stronger and more user friendly. Um, so anyway, check out that Billy Gladstone episode. But so the yes. Gladstone Gretsch partnership, I mean, those are famous. Those are iconic, oh, yeah. very rare snares. So I'm going to just back up a half step to Chet Falzerano. Yeah. Uh, so Chet is amazing. I love Chet. I love the work he does. Uh, he has covered, done so much extensive research research on, um, you know, Billy Gladstone and Chick Webb. Most, you know, a lot of it yeah. around the 1930s. Yeah. Um, you know, Chet. Uh, we're so grateful to Chet and the work he's done. You know, this is his uh, Chick Webb book. Yes. And, you know, spinning the web. Here's a picture of Chet on his Chick oh, Webb yeah. drum set. And uh, you know, this was the Gretsch drums book that Chet Chet actually wrote. Uh, so. Please do check this out. It's a great history book about Gretsch. And I just wanted to, you know, guys like Chet Falzerano and it just and you sure. uh, More have, Chet. A special, <laughs> have a special place in our heart. So I just wanted That's to great. say thank you to Chet for all of the, the work he did. I, I don't have the Billy Gladstone book on my desk, but it might be in my bookshelf somewhere. Yep, 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 so. yep. He's the real deal and really knows his stuff. I need to have him back on for a Chick Webb episode. Uh, oh, because please do. Yeah, I will work on that. You you have reminded me. So um, yeah, and yeah. so for those of you who don't know, it's episode one thirty three with Chet Fazerano talking about. <laughs> I appreciate that because I absolutely will not remember really? which is <laughs> the numbers. Yeah. So I have it in my notes here. So that's awesome. Okay, so maybe real quick though, just touch on the importance of those Gladstone Gretsch snares because Gladstone snares went on. I mean, he made his own snare drums, which are like the holy grail, basically, of like drums. I mean, they're they're you know, this is Gene Krupa's Gladstone. This is Louis Belson's Gladstone. Everyone super famous had their own, but. But mm. the Gladstone Gretsch drums were a little bit different. So mm. it, kind of in a nutshell, what's the story with those? Yeah, well, maybe I think people have heard, you know, the name Gretsch Gladstone, but, you know, I, I don't know how many people actually know what it is. But back then, of course, drums were made with calfskin heads, which would go out of tune really fast. And so you'd have dr snare drummers in the orchestra pit where there was very little room uh, playing a snare drum that would go out of tune you know, a half hour into the show, and it would be needed to, they'd have to tune it on the fly. And because there wasn't much room in the orchestra pit, they weren't able to turn the snare drum over and uh, tune the bottom head. So the concept here is Billy Gladstone created this concept where you can tune the snare drum, the bottom and top head of the snare drum from the top of the drum. Uh, and this was done with a special, it was a three way tuning system. So you could, you know, by turning the tension rod on the top of the snare drum, you could tune the bottom head. And the the drum, it was the drum key that was essential. It had three different heads on it. One head yeah. could would tune the top head, and if you used the other head, it would tune just the bottom head. And if you used the third head, it would tune both heads simultaneously. Uh, and this was a big hit among orchestra drummers. You know, at the time, it was completely made out of metal. It was very expensive at the time. You know, at this time, drums were going for about 30, snare drums were about $35 a pop, and the Gladstone snare cost $100. So, it's, wow. but you know, it was, it was, it's kind of marketed towards the successful orchestral snare yeah. drummers, yeah. who, you know, the top guys. Sure. Right? For, so, for sure. And, and so, this was, um, you know, 37, 38, and, and, and Gretsch took this, the success of this Gladstone marketing name and extended it to include an entire drum set with the great Chick Webb as its main endorser. Hmm. And, you know, you talk about inspirational drummers, you know, Chick Webb for me is probably personally, you know, my, my, the most inspirational drummer for me on, on a personal level. Um, because he was just born into a life with the cards completely stacked against him. Yeah. Uh, as an infant, he fell down some stairs and crushed several vertebrae in his spine, and this developed into um, tuberculosis of the spine. 
and stunted his growth and left him with a sort of hunchback appearance. And but despite all of this, he was able to go on and really rise to prominence as a in the 1930s as um, the orchestra leader of the Chick Webb Orchestra. And yeah. they were the house band for at the Savoy nightclub on Lenox Avenue in Harlem. And uh, he joined forces with Ella Fitzgerald, and together they became international stars with the Tisket a Tasket, their big hit. And um, so his Gretsch Gladstone kit was was really an iconic kit. Um, and I guess you know, you know, I can show it here, but I know that, that, that most people are listening to the podcast. Sure, but, but there, it yeah. is. you get the an idea, and it's a yes. 20, 28 inch bass drum, so a, a proper bass drum nine by 13 and then the floor tom is my favorite floor tom size 16 by 14 so it's 16 deep 14 wide yeah and, and uh a six and a half by 14 gretch gladstone snare of course yeah iconic and he yeah again we'll there will be a full episode on chick webb all right so let me ask you this though so are we still 20th century drums at this point or are we gretch drums right so um Gretsch American in the twenty, you know, I think in the thirties, you know, they're 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 marketing the drums, and in the twenties and thirties, they're really marketing the drums as, as Gretsch American uh, is okay. the name of the drums, and and it's in the thirties where where broadcaster begins as well. Um, you know, this yeah. is really the thirties is really thirty five, thirty six. They get introduced. They don't appear in a catalog until about nineteen thirty nine. So. Got it. Um, it's been said before on the podcast, but the the whole broadcaster thing, Radio King, all of it you can kind of put together with because radio was the the way to get reach people. You know, they would broadcast from these hotels and they would have these people would listen. So that radio theme uh, was super popular, ergo the uh, broadcaster, but with a K. Yeah, and so it was the you know it was the the media the media of the day was was the radio. But um, so my grandfather William Gretsch, who was president from forty two to forty eight, uh, his wife, my grandmother Sylvia Gretsch, was a broadcaster, studied broadcast journalism at Northwestern University, hmm. and it's my grandfather who really started the broadcaster brand. And I'm certain that he thought. I think maybe he asked her, what should we call this new line of drums? And she said, just call them the broadcaster. That's kind of what I yeah. imagine in my head. But who knows? Who knows what it it's is? A, it's a great name. I mean, it's it's I, it's hard to deny that it's just and so is Radio King. So is a mm -hmm. lot of other ones from that that time. But broadcaster is just like it's just cool. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're still we're still selling a lot of broadcaster drums. That's exactly. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. and uh, just going going back to Chick, you know, the the one cool thing I want to talk about with Chick was how um, how battle mad he was. You know, when you talk about the the legend of, of Chick Webb, and he he loved to do drum battles against uh, other prominent drummers and other prominent bands. You know, and and uh, he's a very competitive guy. You know, in 1937, uh, he invites the Benny Goodman Orchestra with Gene Krupa on drums. You know, there's two bandstands at the Savoy nightclub. So, you know, you got Chick's orchestra on one bandstand and then Benny Goodman's on the other with Gene Krupa <laughs> on a Slingerland kit, right? In 1937. And, and they do battle and they're switching off. And, and you know, at the end of the night, uh, Gene Krupa famously stands on, on Benny Goodman's bandstand and, and bows to Chick as if to say, <laughs> you're the king now, you know. That's he, he awesome. Sort of admits defeat. You know, and Man. it's Gene Krupa, who's just one of the greatest drummers of all time. So. Sure. But and, these guys um, always seem to have a bit of a mutual respect for each other, oh, which pe gosh, people yeah. do today as well. But it was like, yeah. uh, it was different. It was like, we're yeah. out here. I mean, they're pioneers. They're, yeah. they're paving the way. Yeah. I mean, it was respect for sure, but it, you had to earn it. You know, you really yeah. had to earn that respect um, back then. And, and, um, and so uh, after that battle, he uh, invites uh, Count Basie to come and do battle uh, shortly after, and and of course Count, Count Basie's drummer was was Joe Jones, who we call today Papa Joe Jones. Yeah, and um, you know you so you can imagine you've got Papa Joe Jones doing you know drum, a drum battle against Chick Webb, and 
Count Basie, you know, had Billie Holiday singing at that time, and Chick Webb had Ella Fitzgerald singing. So they're probably going, you know, competing as well. And you can just imagine, you know, and you read articles from that time, and it says, well, maybe Count Basie finally defeated Chick Webb Orchestra, and all this, you know, back and forth. But you think, like, you know, the people that really won that competition were the people that watched, got to yeah. see this performances between these incredible legendary figures, and certainly two of the greatest Gretsch drummers of all time, arguably. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's interesting how it, it's not recorded. It doesn't live forever. It was a one-off. It was there, there for that night. They do the battle, but then it probably spread in all the newspapers. Like some got, kid was on the street going, Count Basie was taken down or Count Basie won. <laughs> like in that voice, in yeah. that voice, it has to be, they all, uh, they all had that voice. The 1930s um, voice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Which you listen back to old stuff and it seems like they all did, but uh, yeah. it's different than today where it all was, was saved forever. But um, yeah. let's, let's talk more about broadcaster because this is iconic for it to still be around today is clearly it was, it was uh, important. Yeah. Well, you know um, it's, it's here in the 30s, you know, that, that, that Gretsch really introduces Broadcaster for the first time as, you know, appears in the catalog in 1939. And, um, you know, it was really my grandfather, William Gretsch, who really was pushing, you know, we need to make our own brand. We need to make Gretsch, Gretsch. You know, we shouldn't call it these drums Gretsch American or 20th century. They should be called Gretsch. I want yeah. my name on this, these drums. And then he's pushing things along in that direction. And, um, you know, when I talked to my uncle Fred Gretsch, uh, you know, I, I had a conversation with him, and he he was so funny. He said, you know, Lucas, you want to see, you know, the, what the first broadcaster drum looked like, and he shows me a banjo, and I said, what are you talking about? He says, look at this banjo. It's got a fourteen inch drum hoop on it, mm -hmm. a die cast hoop on this banjo, you know, yeah. and and he says, this is the first broadcaster, you know, this and and of course the broadcaster would go on and have die cast hoops on, on the fourteen inch snares. And that was an extension of the banjo, basically. So that yeah. that concept was just applied to the broadcasters, the first broadcasters, and and the early broadcasters had toms tacked on the on the bottom heads, which is a technology that obviously didn't age so well. Yeah, uh, tacked bottom heads, but uh, you also saw these on the Gladstone drums, and you know the first. Um, the first Gladstones were also three plies, just like the first broadcasters, mm. um, and you had. 301 hoops, which was just the single flanged on the toms. And the finishes were Duco white, Duco ebony, or you could pick any color and have a Duco cool. two color combination. So, um, but you know, also like as you know, in the late 1930s, this is also where you see the brands uh, Catalina and, and Renown appear for the first time. And these are also popular price drum sets for students or younger kids that maybe didn't have the budget for a broadcaster or a Gladstone kit. You know, so yeah. like today. And so for folks listening to this who play a broadcaster or a renown or a Catalina, it's just really important that you understand that when you're playing these kits, that you're really engaging and connecting with a heritage and a legacy that goes way, way back in time. Yeah. So I have um, a couple of them, actually. Rob Cook gave me where it's like, I think he reissued, I think it's 1943. Uh, a catalog which was red and you know the kind of thinner one and it was a reissue of that and I remember when my son was born I was like reading it to him you know he wasn't paying attention he was like three weeks old but I was reading through that kind of like for something to do while holding a baby a couple of years ago and uh, I remember coming across Catalina because I used to have a Catalina mod kit um, years ago which was awesome it was so super affordable it was great um, and just being like oh my god I didn't know Catalina went back so long. I mean, this, these, I, I like that you guys have continued with the names and they're, they're so, um, they've been so successful. Why not? Why change it? I mean, C Catalina, renowned broadcaster, these are staples of the company that have been around for a very long time. Sure. It's just, it's a part of the, uh, the tapestry of, of the Gretsch heritage, you know, these yep. names and, and, yep. You know, the, the Catalinas and the Renons back then, they had tempo blocks, <laughs> you know, yeah. it was, it was, they were a bit different. You know, they've evolved, but the name and the general concept has, has stayed. Yeah, for sure. All right. So things are soon going to change, though, because it's an interesting time in general, though, because 1929 to, I guess, 1939, I guess, is sort of considered the Great Depression. So things were mm -hmm. rough all over. But as we enter in the 40s, 
Uh, let's take it from there. And, and, and what, what happened in the 40s for Gretsch? Sure. Well, you know, in the 1940s, we see the, the, you know, the war production board comes along and basically tells all manufacturers that their products cannot be made of more than 10% metal. Obviously, this puts a damper on the whole Gretsch Gladstone snare drum project, which was entirely made of metal. <laughs> a lot of metal. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, our friends at Slingland made uh, the Rolling Bomber and Leedy had the Dreadnought and, you know, drum brands were coming out with these names Gret yep. and Gretsch had the, the Gretsch Defender kit, uh, which had wooden lugs, which were painted silver to look like metal lugs. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and uh, wooden hoops and even uh, had a wooden snare stand. So, um, and the war production board assigns Gretsch to make, because Gretsch had the technology to make hoops out of wood, Gretsch is assigned to make these wooden hoops for gas masks. Um, and, and because Gretsch could mass produce these hoops. So the day shift would come in and work on musical instruments from nine to five. And then from 5 p.m. to 1 a.m., a shift would come in and solely manufacture these wooden, small wooden hoops for gas masks. Wow. Awesome. I, I'm sure maybe John probably referred to it. John Sheridan probably referred to that in his episode. And I probably forgot, but I love hearing that stuff about what they made after yeah. hours, like Rogers making the gauges for like airplanes or whatever. It's neat to hear, uh, just cause they, it's such a special time. It's like, yeah. you have the ability to do this. You're going to do it. And then yeah. the L 37, uh, edict or whatever, where the, the, the 10% metal it, it's, Man, it really, I feel like everyone, it kind of leveled the playing field a little bit for drum brands where none of you are using metal. You all have to make it work. Uh, yeah. Good luck. And you're going to have to make war specific items as well on top of that. So tough times. Yeah. And, and you know, I think, you know, the focus was, I think people were very enthusiastic about doing whatever it took to help yeah. the cause, you know, totally. I think. You know, I don't think people were so focused on making sure their drum company was profitable in, in these few years. You know, it was, yeah. you know, let's win the war, you know, yeah. so it was kind of a, you know, they, they did it uh, with it with a spirit that, that we're not familiar with today, you know. Sure. And, and, and you, you know, you talk about, it's so interesting because there, there are so many prominent figures uh, coming into Gretsch later on after the world, after World War II. Guys like Duke Kramer and Phil Grant and and Fred Gretsch Jr., who were all war vets, and the, these were the guys running Gretsch in the in the heyday, in the first golden age of Gretsch in the fifties and sixties. And these were tough guys, you know, the greatest generation. You yeah. know, and you talk about, you know, if we ever were put placed in a boxing ring against these guys, we'd be lying flat on our back after uh, ten seconds, right? These were yes. these guys were tough, and they were, you know. The greatest generation so yeah played yeah. A big role seen, Gretsch. they had it's obvious they had seen some stuff you know what i mean they had done yeah. some stuff and uh very very uh scary stuff i'm sure and when you're in that you know in war so to come back and have to handle a business probably seems like you know i i got this I, yeah. you know piece no big cake. deal piece of cake and so in in 1942 during the war that's when fred gretch senior the second generation fred retires and um, he leaves the company to his oldest son, Fred Gretsch Jr. But shortly after Pearl Harbor happens and Fred Gretsch Jr. leaves and joins the Navy um, to, to fight the war in the Pacific. And so his younger brother, William Gretsch, who's my grandfather, uh, mm -hmm. runs the company uh, starting in 1942. And, um, you know, this is the year also where my grandfather marries Sylvia Gretsch, uh, my grandmother. Uh, in December of that same year. So pretty um, cool, you know, and, and so Fred Gretsch Jr. goes to the Pacific and he didn't talk much about uh, the war when he came back, um, but he served with distinction as, as a, a commanding officer in the Navy. And, and uh, he was a part of the construction battalion in the Pacific. So they were also called the Seabees. So they would build, his job was to build landing strips. So you cool. know, there was this famous battle of Tarawa in World War II, which was just a gruesome battle. And uh, the U.S. won the battle, took over the island. And the next day, Fred Gretsch Jr. arrives uh, with the construction battalion and builds the landing strip on Tarawa. And so that's that's what he was doing during the war. Jeez. 
(laughs) that's again it puts it into perspective uh making some drums and some banjos is a little bit easier than dealing with uh stuff like that so well you know your family thank you again i think everyone can say like it is the greatest generation so it's like you know that service they provided is huge absolutely absolutely and um so this is we're in the 40s here and and you know basically marketing broadcaster exclusively after the war um, it's it's all about broadcaster and, and we've got the great Joe Jones as our main endorser, but there's lots of great drummers at, in the 40s. Um, Dave Tuff, who of course, uh, with Dave Tuff, we introduced the 20 inch ba- bass drum, which is also another first, you know, where, um, and um, you see Louis Belson. So 1947, Louis Belson is, is looking to find a manufacturer that will help him build a double bass drum set and uh, he comes to Gretsch and the production manager at Gretsch at the time is a gentleman by the name of Bill Hagner who would be the production manager throughout the 50s and 60s as well and Louis says you know Bill I want I want this drum kit I want it to have double bass drums Bill says okay well let's see what we can do you know uh, I'll see if I can put one together and then Louis says you know not only do I want two bass drums which is a crazy idea but I want this drum set to glow in the dark (laughs) when I perform and so Bill goes out and gets his hands on this like white phosphorescent paint. And in the spray booth back then, the drums and guitars were were in the same room. They were sprayed, you know, lacquer sprays and paint sprays were was all happening in the same room. So Bill sprays Louis' double bass drum set with this white phosphorescent paint and leaves it to dry overnight. And he comes back the next day. And all the racks of guitars and all the walls are just covered with this white phosphorus <laughs> paint, which was just floating in the air throughout the Oops. night. <laughs> and, uh, but in any case, the kit's made, and this is 1947, and, and a few weeks later at the Paramount Theater, Louis Belson performs wow. on the first double bass drum drum set, and it's glowing in the dark. Huh. That's so, crazy, because you don't really, in videos and things like that, you're not... A lot of times things that are earlier black and white and you can't really tell a yeah. detail like that unless right, a, you hear a, an, an account like that um yeah. which man louis and that is very early i mean i think there's there is debate over who was first with double bass but in my accounts that i've seen i mean if that's 1947 that's pretty darn early on maybe someone put two bass drums together before but a manufactured kit as a mm. double bass drum set uh, because later there's like Rufus, Speedy Jones, Sam Woodyard did it. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I would, I'm in Team Louie of being the first to actually play a manufactured double bass kit, um, which gotta love Louie, you know? <laughs> Thank you, Bart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just, uh, let's talk quickly about Kenny Clark and then we'll yep. wrap it up with the death of my grandfather. So, sure. Um, Okay, so it's also in the 40s that we see the arrival of Kenny Clark, who is playing with Thelonious Monk at... Uh, playing very fr- frequently at Minton's Playhouse. And Kenny sort of, Kenny Clark is given credit for starting bebop or bebop drumming, you know, yeah. at, up until his innovations, you know, swing drummers were just playing kind of four on the bass drum. And uh, Kenny changes all of that and takes takes it to the next level by playing the ride cymbal heavier and comping with his left hand on the snare and dropping bombs with his right foot yeah. on the bass drum and completely turns that all around. And Ke- Kenny's one of our great uh, Gretsch drummers, yeah. um, legacy drummers that we're very proud of and very proud that he was playing a Gretsch. So. Yeah. yeah, he's <laughs> unbelievable. And it's, I wish we had this video technology earlier because getting, you know, starting with Kenny and Louie, we do get more video documentation to be able to see these guys, which clearly mm-hmm. nowadays with YouTube and stuff influences people and recordings are better and you can hear things differently. So yeah. we're, we're lucky to get guys like that where we can actually hear it and see it. For sure. And, um, you know, we, we just had so few people actually seeing these amazing performers, you know, who, who saw Papa Joe Jones play live, who saw Chick Webb play live, who saw Kenny Clark yeah. play live, you know, so f- such yeah. few people, you know, but yeah it makes them kind of mythical and it takes them to a special place in our minds. And, and we know they were doing some really special things. They were innovating on a level that we can't imagine uh, yep. happening today, you know? Yep. And, um, and that's, you know, we really see bebop starting and bebop is just going to play a huge role in future decades for the Gretsch company. 
uh, yep. moving into the 50s and 60s. So, and um, so as we moved, progressed sort of to the, to the late 40s, you know, so my, my uncle, or I'm sorry, my grandfather, William Gretsch, uh, becomes president in 1942 when his brother goes to the Navy and he, he stays as president. When, when my uncle returns from, from the war, he, he, he's into the banking just like his father and is focused on his banking business. And my grandfather's the president. And the plan was that my grandfather would continue being the president. But in 1948, he dies at the young age of 41. Um, and, um, and it's at that point when my grandfather dies that his brother then leaves banking and, and comes to the Gretsch company full time. And he leads the Gretsch company from 1948 until... 1967 when it sold to Baldwin which would be considered there's many golden eras of Gretsch as we you and I have talked on the the phone many times before this but there's lots of Gretsch is so old there's tons of golden eras yeah um, sure. which in the 50s we're getting into another one but uh hmm. which for the sake of time we will save that for another episode um which uh, I would love to have Lucas back so if, if people like listening to this and want a part two of this or kind of picking it up there, let us know. I'm sure people will. So obviously, Lucas, I'd love to have you back. But God, 41 years old. It's such a shame. I mean, the life expectancy of people, you know, I can't imagine that. I mean, I'm 32. That's like, I'm not that far off from that. It's just terrible to think of someone dying so young. But clearly, he had a very big impact on the drum world um, and is a part of drum history. I mean, we're talking about it many, 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 many years later on a podcast uh mm. i mean such a cool family story i mean you're you're a lucky guy to be in the gretch family for sure yeah i feel very lucky to be in the family and i am very very proud to be in the gretch family and you know our family has a lot of key members dying at very young ages and and there is a sense of tragedy to to so much of what happened in in the gretch family and you know but we've continued forward as a family-owned business and as a legacy. And you know, yep. next year we're going to se- we're going to celebrate our 140th anniversary as a family business. You know, wow. and, and in 2018 we were celebrating two, you know 135th anniversary. You know, every five years we kind of do a celebration to celebrate sure. the, the longevity of the company, and it's amazing. And it it's also it's a bit daunting because. With every celebration, every five years, you know, in a way, the stakes get a little bit higher, you know, because you 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 know you can you can screw up a family business that's twenty years old or forty years old, but if you're the guy that screws up a family business that's one hundred and forty years old, yeah, it's maybe Oops. not so good, right? <laughs> yeah, so the, there's the stakes are higher, and 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 the responsibility of the family to to keep the heritage alive and to talk about the business and to talk about the history. You know, I, 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 for me, it's very important, especially the early years to, to present the story so that people playing Gretsch drums know what, what, what happened to Gretsch and what was going on within the organization and and with the family and the role that the Gretsch family played. Yeah. So, yep. Which this has been an awesome look at, the family. I mean, obviously, on some episodes, you can go super deep into what lug was used in 1935, what hoops were used in the 40s. But uh, I mean, for an, an hour plus episode, it's nice to just kind of get an overview of the family from a family member, um, which as we wrap up, Lucas, we got to tell people about your Gretsch heritage series that you have uh, produced with Gretsch, obviously, that's on the Gretsch YouTube channel and all that stuff, which I will share in the description. But give us a quick rundown of that so folks can get excited to watch it and learn more because you your production value is and the video is is more than I do. Um, and it's just it's it's awesome. So tell us about that. Wow. Well, thank you, Bart. That's really nice of you to say that. And sure. I really appreciate you saying that. Um yeah, so the show basically was it's, we made a total of eleven episodes. It's available on Gretsch Drums YouTube, and uh, it features you know a 10, 15 minute history lesson. And then we have we had uh, Mark Schulman on the show. We had Cindy Blackman Santana on the show. We also had some fun dealers, the guys from Pro Drum Hollywood, and and um, yeah. you know Steve Maxwell was on the show. And we're just basically geeking out about uh, Gretsch Drums. And we yeah. also pay a visit to the Gretsch Drums factory and talk with Paul and Josh and the production guys. They show us, you know, a quick little 
inside view of what's going on inside the drum factory. So you, it's it's a fun show, and uh, it's available now on uh, Gretsch Drums YouTube channel. So yes, and I will share it. And and it's it, I just kind of think of like this podcast as being a broad overview of a ton of different topics. But if you know you mm -hmm. want to zoom in further on just Gretsch, this is where you do it. Uh, directly from the source from a family member. So uh, as usual, it'll be in the description um, for people to check out. And um, later in the week on uh, Thursday or Friday, I'm going to put up a cool video and a podcast short episode, the news stuff I've been doing about a cool article that I sent to Lucas about uh, kind of a bandit and a robbery and the Gretsch factory and all this stuff, which I sent to you and you were like, no one has seen this. We haven't seen it. No one saw it. <laughs> Yeah. So, Hands up. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. and I'll, I'll I'll release it to everyone later in the week. Uh, so you can hear that. That'll be its, its own short little thing that should be in your podcast feed um, or on YouTube as well with the visuals. So you guys can check that out. Um, but on that note, Lucas, my friend, I feel like uh, it's been great to get to know you because we've been talking for a couple, I would say, year or two now of just like yeah. we should do this. We should do this. And now we've actually done it. Um, and it's been great. And like I said, you got to come back for another one to finish Gretsch from the 50s uh, on up to today. We'll do that a little bit down the road. Um, but sure. again, let people who are listening, let us know. Find it the post on social media or email me or message me or something. Let me know that you enjoyed it. And uh, then I'll make sure to have it happen sooner than later with getting Lucas back on. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you sharing your knowledge here, man. It's been awesome. Well, thanks Bart. And I would love to come back and continue talking about, uh, my family's history and thank you so much for giving us the platform to do so really appreciate that.